Hi, good vach, or more accurately, uh, good Wednesday morning. I'm trying to record this in time to have it ready for you. It's coming to Muxi Shabbos at 8 o'clock. Now the clock has been changed. And you should be sitting snug in your uh, bed or whatever on a cold Saturday night uh, at your convenience. We are uh, looking tonight at the trying to figure out how to explain it. Originally this was supposed to be uh, 15 lectures, but as things turn out sometimes you have to add one. And tonight's talk, which is going to be about the Ethiopian Jews, once I started writing it up, it turned to be such a large subject after breaking into the two parts. So this week will be part one I plan and next week will be part two. It's a long and complicated story. It's an interesting story, but it's a long and complicated story. So before I plunge into my remarks, let me begin as I always do by saying that we're now in the winter lecture series of 2020 to 2021 on the state of Israel and the Jewish people in the years 1984 to 88. The name of the series is Roller Coaster, the state of Israel and the Jewish people in the 1980s. Today's the fourth lecture, of and now it's going to be 16 altogether. Uh, and the title of tonight's lecture is Operation Moses, Israel and the Jews of Ethiopia in the 80s. Actually, that was the original title when I dreamed this up. You might say it's going to be Jews of Ethiopia and Israel, part one, and next week part two, as we shall see. I always thank the Lehman family, it's Lehman Lecture Series, for being the series sponsor. Tonight's specific lecture sponsor, as you can see, is uh, Mr. and Mr. Bobby Glazer down in Florida. Uh, in memory of uh, their uncle, as I mentioned the other day, Harold Glazer, we all missed, uh, famous Balkori, among other things, and, and physician. And also in memory of uh, Norman Friedman, these are Randallstown people. <laughs> if some of you will instantly know when I say Randallstown, other of you will have no idea what I'm talking about. So we honor their memory, and thank you for the sponsorship. I, uh, as always, want to thank our tech team, my son Yehuda Leib, is taking off of his time to make sure that this runs uh, technically correctly. Uh, once it's done, the plan is to have it edited and Yossi Westley will work his magic on it to make it easy for you to uh, see the PowerPoint. Um, Howard Elbaum is the one who made the PowerPoint. Uh, every year, the team unfolds. Paul Stein is giving valuable information uh, and help in terms of the audio. And uh, I can't do anything without the technical assistance, so I'm very grateful and you should be grateful to all of them uh, for doing this. Uh, as you know, by now, this is supposed to appear at 8 o'clock on my YouTube channel. So those of you who have been until now, you'll know where to look up and hopefully it'll be there at the right time at 8 o'clock this coming Saturday night. Um, if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, please do so. It helps me. Uh, I'm happy to say that we have all the lectures now sponsored and anybody who wants to help uh, as some of you asked, it's very nice that you ask uh, with the, uh, I need help always with the podcast, which I do twice a week. And if you're interested in any information, just email me. And now, with any further ado, I'll get down to the body of my remarks, which again is about the Jews of Ethiopia and uh, the state of Israel. It culminates next week in Operation Moses, which is probably not what you imagine it is. And to tell you the truth, once I actually started to write this down and think it through, I realize there's a whole story here that I'm sure nobody knows, which is of uh, very great importance uh, to all of us, especially in context of racism and anti-racism. Tonight is a story of Jewish racism. I repeat, Jewish racism versus Jewish anti-racism. Uh, it's sad to have to talk about this, but it's part of our history. So I begin from the very with the following point. We're talking about the Ethiopian Jewish population which by now, if we go to the first uh, slide, you'll see is uh, 140,000 in the state of Israel today in 2020, Kane Yerbo, you have 6.8 million Jews. That's the number. In the state of Israel today, you got 6.8 million Jews, of whom about 150,000, a little bit less, are Ethiopian Jews. Okay? Uh, this is a relatively new phenomenon in the history of the state of Israel, and that's exactly what we're going to be talking about. 
Uh, as I just said, I'm talking about the Jews of Ethiopia, but who exactly are they? Uh, see, the problem is nobody knows for sure. Uh, we, you don't have a, a direct link to say that you can prove, you can prove that we've been Jewish for thousands and thousands of years, all the way back to, you know, when the Jews were in Israel. But before you become smug, none of us knows that we're really Jewish either. There's nobody today, white or black, who can say that I have proof, I repeat proof, that I'm Jewish and I go all the way back to, you know, the biblical period or the Bayashani period or something like that. I know there are people running around and say, I have a yichas. I do have a yichas brief if you want to get down to that. And people say, well, we can trace ourselves back to the Rashi, which, by the way, is possible. If you're Ashkenazic Jew, it is possible. If you're Sephardic Jew, it is possible to trace yourself back to the Rambam. But that doesn't prove anything. Rashi was an Ashkenazic Jew in the 10 hundreds. How do you know Rashi was Jewish? You get my point? In other words, there's no documentation, there's no proof, as we call in the history profession, you have actual, you know, certificates or things like this, they can literally prove that you're Jewish. I know it sounds funny to say, how do you know Rashi was Jewish? But I just want to be very clear about this. All you find is people say like this, I can go back to Rashi, and everybody knows that Rashi comes from Yochan Asandler because it says so in a safer somewhere. Saying in a safer somewhere is not the same thing as actually having documentation. So before you come smug about the Jews of Ethiopia, ask yourself, pinch yourself and say, how do you know that you are Jewish? You cannot prove it. Okay, you cannot prove it. Uh, now, there have definitely been large numbers of Jews of one sort or another in Ethiopia. Well, let's, let me be more exact. There have definitely been in Ethiopia large numbers of people for the last 2,000 years who have identified as Jews. That we can trace. Okay? That we can trace. Now, 2,000 years is not that long in Jewish history, <laughs> correct? It's pretty long, but it's not that long in Jewish history. Where did these guys come from in Ethiopia? Nobody knows for sure. I repeat, I know they have their traditions about Shlomo Melch and all this baloney stuff, and others have other traditions. Nobody knows. Right? Like we start with saying nobody knows, just like nobody knows that you're Jewish. Nobody can prove it. Now, um, since nobody knows, this creates what we call halachic problems. I, but the word halacha is a relatively new term in Jewish history. The word halacha. It goes to the very heart of the question, what exactly is Judaism? And who exactly are the Jews, exactly? Now, that's not a simple question, especially for a historian. You and I subscribe to what we call the rabbinic narrative. This is a narrative that traces a certain development in Judaism, arguing that this development of Judaism spread all over the world after the destruction of Beis Hamikdash, when Judaism, of course, was deprived of its cultic character. We all know that once upon a time, the Jewish religion was centralized around Jerusalem and the Beis Hamikdash and sacrifices and Tum and Tyra and all the rest of it, Kachim and Tyra, as they call it in the Yishi world, all which doesn't exist anymore ever since the Beis Hamikdash was destroyed. So I repeat, the central nature of Judaism was once involved around a whole series of practices which no longer exist. We hope and we pray that they'll come back, but they haven't been around for a couple thousand years. So what happened? Judaism reinvented itself or modified itself to some degree or another. If you don't have a base of music, you better come up with Azim Akamli, and you better come up with a base of Knesset and Davening and all kinds of other institutions. I'm speaking specifically in the terms of regular Jewish history, the regular rabbinic narrative of the Talmud, which became, of course, the supreme canonical text within Judaism, but which was published around the year 500 A.D., that's relatively recent, 1,500 years ago. And which purported, as we all know, to contain the oral law, the Torah Shavuot Pet. And I'm referring also to the Talmudization process of the Jews, which occurred in the course of the Middle Ages. You don't need me to tell you, some of you do, but you, know, you shouldn't need me to tell you, once upon a time, the Gemara didn't exist. Right? Once upon a time, the Gemara didn't exist. It's a document. It's a text. It's a series of texts, actually. And they all come together without arguing over the specifics in the first five centuries. So but let's say by 500 or 600, I don't want to get into that, you actually have a, a book, a text called the Gemara. Well, wasn't there beforehand. So what was Shabbos? What was Kashrus? What was Tarsim Shabbat? What was Gavis? What was Gitan? All the rest of it before the Gemara existed. Now, um, but there was. So the Talmudization that occurred, now we don't know how it happened, but we know what happened. I always say, we know what the train looked like before it, 
uh, entered the tunnel, and we know what the train looked like after it entered the tunnel, we just don't know what happened in the tunnel. Before it entered the tunnel, the Jewish religion was not Talmudic because the Talmud didn't exist. And by the time it comes out of the tunnel, it does. How exactly they transform, we don't know exactly. So, once it happened though, once everybody and all the scattered Jewish communities around the world, almost, not Ethiopia, almost, uh, accepted over the course of a long time, over centuries, the Talmud. You understand when the Gemara came out, they didn't have a constitutional convention like you had in the United States, and everybody got together and said, we now uh, pass a resolution that we're going to follow this book. Nothing like that happened. And so it's a slow percolation process. The Karaites represent the forces that resisted this percolating process. It's a whole complicated subject. But nevertheless, the Talmudization introduced a certain uniformity of practice, a certain way of thinking, and even of identity within the Jews in their scattered communities in Europe, Asia, and North Africa. A uniformity which replaced the diversity, sometimes extreme diversity, which had differentiated communities before that. Okay? So, for example, <coughs> let's look at that. This is obvious. Anybody with a little bit of knowledge knows this. What's the first mission that you're supposed to learn in Yeshiva in Gitin? I may be getting them say, I'm sorry, I'm funny, funny, Right? My son's learning this in Israel. He better be. And so somebody brings a get from overseas uh, to Palestine in the Roman times, in times of Mishnah. He has to say a certain formula. Why? Because they don't know about Lishma and Chutzlars. Meaning, a basic law necessary for the halachic system, the Talmudic system, to regard a divorce document as valid, it has to be Lishma. Don't worry about what that means. They're telling you right away, Overseas, people don't know about that, or they're not fam often not familiar with it. So what happened to all these Jewish communities in all these places around the world outside of Israel, throughout the Roman Empire, for example, where people get married, people get divorced, and they get they're not cr done correctly? Whoops. You see what I'm saying? So in the Talmudic text itself, and in many other places, you see that the, Talm the Talmudization introduced the uniformity, almost a kind of centralized uniformity, even though it's a literary centralization, which is interesting, not a bureaucratic and administrative centralization, uh, which didn't exist before. Now, I hope I'm not getting too uh, fancy on you. Um, again, let's go to the next one. Specifically in the area of who's a Jew. You have uh, born Jews and converts. Conversion now is, is crystallized into a certain process. But it wasn't always that way. Here's from the Gemara in Yuvam. It's a very famous Gemara that you see in front of you. Where Rabbi Nechemia says, Echel Geir Rais, Echel Geir Chalomus, Echel Geir Mordechai Vester, Enim Gashi Bizman Azet. Right? And the Gemara says, An opinion, Amr Rabbi Yitzhak Bar Marta, between the Rav, Halacha Kedivriam Kulam Geir Hain. That people whose conversion process was not according to oil necessarily, not according to what you and I regard as the necessary conversion process today, with Mila, Tvila, Kabbalah Smitzes, Based in the whole nine yards, actually, those people were considered Jewish, even though they did not go through that system. And below in the second paragraph, you see a Tosus, which talks about who are the Gere Mordechai, and these are the people. Um, let me just see over here. The Netosu Gamisel Gishlomar, in the large letters, Me'asim this Gairu, Kira Ashkechon, Gavi Mordechai Vester, Rabbi Me'amarts Misyadim. I think you will, perhaps, some of you will remember the passage in the Megillus Esther where it says, once Mordechai rose to power, Rabbi Me'ami Arts Misyadim. A lot of people were Misyahed. Now, what does that mean? It could translate a lot of different ways. But obviously, Tosis is saying, and the Gemara seems to be implying, they declared themselves Jewish. <laughs> they declared themselves Jewish. Look what it says. Me'asim in the sky, Ru. Kidashkan Rabbi Arts Misyadim. They declared themselves Jewish. Now, it's possible to read that toast in a slightly different way, but it's also possible to read the way I just said. I'm simply pointing out to you that once upon a time there was a profound diversity across the Jewish world, which would make a halachist uh, smack his head and go, Ay vey, and yet it ex existed. <coughs> okay? Um, this created the traditional Judaism, as we see in the next slide, that I've often used these terms, with which you and I and everyone else have become familiar, if you've ever listened to any of my talks, and the Judaism of the Talmud is one with a certain type of fundamentalism, a certain type of fundamentalism, including Toshav Iksav and Toshav a certain type of nomianism in which 
everything is focused on getting the Talmudic laws right. Coercive Jewish communities and cultural insularity. These are the basic pillars upon which the message from the Talmudic texts, te texts uh, emerges. Now, this is what Judaism has been to us in the West. Right outside of Ethiopia, let's put it that way. Even secular Jews, Reform Jews, in its various iterations of Reform Judaism and secular Judaism, define themselves in relation to the tradition. Notice, uh, a secular Jew will say like this, I know what the Jewish tradition was in the past. I don't subscribe to it because I'm not a fundamentalist. So we're having the same conversation. Me, myself and I. I could have a conversation with a secular Jew, Reform Jew, whatever, and, he, and this person would say, Yes, I understand the rules about Shabbos, all the rest of it, but we don't believe in that. So, and I can say I believe in it. So that's a conversation, because we're talking about the same thing. We're talking about the same thing. Now, um, here's a good one. I could have a civil, interesting conversation with a form Jew, and he would say, you have to do this because of Tikkun Olam. And I would say, what the heck is Tikkun Olam? There is no such thing like that. It's a, it's a recently invented term. And he said, no, it isn't. I said, well, let's look at the use of Tikkun Olam in the, in the Talmud, in the Bible, in the, the, the literature of classic Judaism. And you see, it doesn't exist. That's a conversation, because we're all talking about the same Talmud, we're talking about the same Bible. Now, uh, there have been Jewish communities in history who have been relatively isolated, but in their case, they sooner or later were brought into line. You know the Bukharan Jews, if you know the history of the Bukharan Jews in Central Asia, they were like the Ethiopian Jews. I mean, they did their own thing and they practiced their own way, often had radically at variance with the uh, halachic norms. There's a famous story then in the 1700s, a certain Sephardi Shliach, Mashalach, who came there to raise money, came to Bukhara, his name was Maimon, and uh, he said, what are you guys doing? You're not practicing the Jewish religion in the right way. And they simply said, I guess, we didn't know, okay, show us what to do. And he did that. He became their guide of Judaism. He said, this is how you do Shabbos, this is how you do Kashrus, this is how you do this, that, and the other, and they simply followed him. So in other words, they had been isolated, but then they were normalized. They brought into the norms of the regular Judaism, and they became part of the international Jewish culture. Uh, more recently, if we go to the next slide, the famous Rav Hankin, some of us remember in New York, this is a picture of his old man, but when he was a young man, his first position was as a rabbi in Gruzia in Georgia, which I'm talking about in, uh, in Russia, again, in Georgia on the Black Sea. And I remember reading this, he, he came there also, that was a Horban in the halachic sense. Their marriages weren't right, according to Hoyle. Their gitten were defective. The kashos is no good, this, that, and the other. And it's part of the story of Henkin that he was a tremendous tzaddik and diplomat. And Drachar Darchi Noam, he very slowly and in a very nice way got them to normalize. Ad Kadei Kach, I remember seeing once that Rabbi Tights from Elizabeth, the old man, um, who visited Russia like in 1956 and went to Georgia, Soviet Union, and Tbilisi. And he went to the Shlachtois that they had over there, a place of the, where they did the kosher shrita, which is interesting that you could do that in Soviet Georgia. And there they, they still had the instructions of Rabbi Henkin on the wall. Meaning, he wrote to him exactly how you're supposed to shrita, badik, and all the other things, and they followed it. So we do have examples from time to time of what I call normalization. If you want to be very uh, obnoxious, you say Balchut. They were doing the wrong thing, now they came Balchut. But that's an obnoxious term. Okay? Now, if Ethiopian Jewry is really a historic Jewish community, <coughs> then they obviously never ran into a Rabbi Henkin. It simply didn't have the incident that I just described. That somebody came from elsewhere and said, hey, you're doing this wrong and this wrong, and this is what Jews do. And they said, okay, well, we'll follow. They just simply didn't have such a person like that. It could be that if they had encountered such a person, they would have changed and brought their practices into the norms of other Jewish communities around the world. That's my point. Now, let's go to the next one. It's strange that they had no rabbi or anyone contact them, because if you don't know your geography, which most people don't, contrary to popular belief, Ethiopia is not in the heart of darkest Africa, cut off and away from everybody else. Ethiopia, historically, has always been very close to a very important Jewish community I'm calling the Yemenite Jews. Yemen has been a major center of Jewish culture, among other things, a major center of rabbinic culture, great scholars, Tamidic Chacham, Talmudists, and all the rest of it. And look at the map. If you see 
On the left, you see Eritrea and Djibouti. That's the Ethiopian, in other words. And uh, it's the Straits of Baba Magdebda. Notice, it's very close to Yemen. Look how there's a small body of water separating them. For all I know, you can swim it. Uh, right? You see what I'm saying? On the right side is what you call Yemen. Where's the Sana? That's the capital. And the left side is what you call Ethiopia. So the Jews of Ethiopia were actually were located around here. We're, we're close to what... Uh, to an important Jewish community. So, to use modern terminology, it's like you had this isolated, separate community of Amish Jews that didn't know anything, and they're close to Philly or Baltimore, not that far away. So, it's hard to understand how this happened. But it happened. And indeed, in different times and eras, there were small communities of Yemenite Jews and Aden Jews, Adeni Jews, they call them, in Eritrea. Do you see... Before I leave this, do you see um, this map on the left side, the Africa side? Do you see is er Eritrea and Djibouti. These are provinces that are sort of Ethiopian. They were ruled in the 1800s by uh, Italy and France. Um, Italy in Eritrea and France in Djibouti. Uh, but they're really Ethiopian. And as you see in the map that you have in front of you, if you went back 100 years ago, 150 years ago, 140 years ago, on the port cities over there, like uh, Asmara and whatever, there were uh, Jews from Yemen and Aden. Aden is part of Yemen. It's like at the bottom of Yemen over there, but it's a British colony. So the, the, it's a special case. And, uh, you know, for business purposes, as Jews do, they would set up uh, little Jewish communities, Taimani communities. Uh, I'll use the word Sephardi, but they're not Sephardi. But that kind of thing. Uh, in territory that's Ethiopian. But what's funny is, we don't hear about them interacting with Ethiopian Jews. Right? And why don't Ethiopian Jews say, who are you guys? Oh, you're Yemeni Jews. What's this, a shoal? Oh, we have a shoal differently. Well, let's show you how we do it. We don't have any trace, at least as far as I know, of this kind of intercourse. One last point. Rabbinic literature and, and culture, the halachic system in general, is extremely self-referential. Uh, you have to understand that. That's very good to our story today. From the point of view of Torah literature, you can't, or the, the, the rules of the game are, you can only bring in in your legal discussions facts that you cull from other rabbinic sources. Um, the Bible, the Talmud, the Medrash, or other shalos and with other responses perhaps. You can't say, for example, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you exactly what I mean. You can't say, we learn the rules of suicide, uh, whether you're allowed to or not allowed to, from Masada. Masada does not exist in rabbinical literature. Why do you say Masada doesn't exist? Mm. It's not in the Gemara. It's not in Chazal. It's not in Medrash. It's not brought down Shalos and Shuvas. It's only in Josephus. Josephus doesn't count. He's excluded from the rabbinic literature. You get what I'm saying? Unless... Unless, unless, some big rabbi, let's say, for example, Ramban or somebody like Rajva, would quote from Josephus, Yosefon, whatever, and then, because the Rajva did it, so others might be able to use it in play. So, the halachic system is highly self-referential. This is modified today, in the 21st century, I would say in the last 50, 60 years, in the medical area, because there's so much medical technology coming out that a lot of it gets surprisingly incorporated into modern response and things of that nature. But ordinarily, the fruits of the academic lecture are not supposed to play any role in halachic decision making. And I'm going somewhere with this. Ethiopian Jews appear a few times in the response to literature in the Shalos and Shibas, and they seem to be regarded as Jews, perhaps as sectarians like the Karaites, but as Jews. Let's go to the next one. Here we have the famous <coughs> Shalos and Shubas of the Radbaz, or David ben uh, Abizimra, who was a very big posik, a Sephardic rabbi, one of the big biggies, of the 1500s, in which you had a whole bunch of big biggie Sephardic rabbis who were big poskim. And it's like five volumes of the Radbaz, Shalos and Shubas. I have them over here. And as you can see, there was a rabbi in Baldwin, Rabbi Goldman from the Chizik who wrote a whole book. It's a flawed book about the response of the Ibn Zimra. And the good one is the German one, low side, for Professor Zimbels. But anyway, he's a name, okay? 
the Radbaz is a posik like the Chassam Sofer, like that sort of thing. And uh, it's a famous Chuba, and he lived in the 1500s, and he was a big rabbi in Egypt. He was also a multimillionaire and a successful merchant, and so he's very aware of what's going on in the world. And of course, Egypt has the Nile, and up and down the Nile was brought all kind of stuff, including slaves. And there's a whole famous response when somebody said, I remember exactly, they bought a slave, it turns out it was a, a, a female slave, and she turned out to be from the Ethiopian Jews. There was a whole question, you know, uh, of marriage and divorce and all the rest of it. By the time the discussion is over, I didn't want to get into great detail in this uh, thing because it'll turn into a shear, and that's not my point today. Uh, by the time the discussion is over, you see the Radbaz. I repeat, it's like the Nod of Yehuda, he's a big guy. He says, these people are Jewish. Um, we know about them. Uh, they're obviously not rabbinite Jews, meaning they don't follow the halachas that the rest of the Jews follow. But he even says they're not like the Karaites or something like that because they're not doing it out of spite. They just don't know. They're Tinnik Shanishbas. You understand? They're all the way out in Africa somewhere and they don't know. If somebody would show them the right way, they would do it. And so, as they said before, they're Jews of a certain variety. He said, like, it's a Dukim or something like that. So he recognized their Jewish identity. This was in the 16th century. Uh, in fact, as I said before, they're better than the Karaites. Now, that means, from the point of view of rabbinic literature, you have a locus classicus, a very important uh, source, if you choose to follow this, in which you see rabbis long ago, 500 years ago, and his Talmudim also held that way, regarded the Jews of Ethiopia as Jewish. Now, by contrast, modern secular, ethnographical research would say that these Ethiopian Jews are not Jewish. Mm. They're, you know, like the black Jews in Harlem or something like that. Just because you say you're Jewish doesn't mean you're Jewish. Correct? So, um, how do I go? If me, I'm trying to evaluate, are these people halakhically Jewish? Uh, do I go by the rabbis? Or do I go by some professor who's done extensive ethnographical research as a result of this and historical, archaeological research in Ethiopia, and the result that says that the Ethiopian Jews are really a bunch of non-Jews that just decided to call themselves Jewish at one point in history, or something along those lines. Okay? Different theories. Uh, now, before you're smug, the ethnographers could say the same thing about you, as I said before. Go to the next one. Didn't Arthur Kessler write the book? I talked about it this summer. You, if you're an Ashkenazi Jew, for example, from Eastern Europe, you're a Karaite. You're not from the Jewish people, or many of you aren't anyway. Uh, that's what some ethnographers say. So would Yasser Arafat, because that way he can say that Israelis don't have a right to uh, Israel. He has a key Arab uh, Taina. Uh, and the Jews say, no, we're Jewish, and we can go back all the way. Can you prove it? You see? Can you prove it in the sense through documentation? Keep coming back to this uh, problem. So ironically, the rabbinical literature... Um, approach was more liberal regarding the Ethiopian Jews than the secular approach, which is the opposite of how it usually goes in the state of Israel. For example, in the case of the Soviet Aliyah, when the Russians start coming in the zillions, which is for next year, hopefully, Mir Hashem, as in the years 1988 to 1992, so you had a ton of people who are not Jewish, and uh, you know, from the and we have this problem we're struggling with in the state of Israel today, and the Russians don't like it, and the Jewish courts will say, how can you prove you're Jewish? And, you know, the ethnographers will say, well, they come from Jewish roots, it's good enough, they're Jewish. And the Basin of the Rabbanut will say, no, we don't go by the ethnographers, we don't go by the quote-unquote scientists, and, you know, it's a, it's a home of Vulcan. Here, but in the case of Ethiopian Jews, it's the opposite. The uh, rabbinical literature is the one saying they're Jewish, and the other one saying not. Now, I could spend an hour going through all the details of the rabbinical literature on this subject, particularly from the 19th century, when, thanks to modernity, exploration, European colonialism, context increased between European Jews on the one hand and the Jews of Ethiopia. But I'm not going to do that. I would simply point to Rav Hildesheimer, the leading Orthodox rabbi, of course, in Germany, together with Rav Hirsch, who, if you know anything about him, championed the cause of the Ethiopian Jews and say, these are our brothers and sisters, we got to do something to help them. He was particularly worried about the fact that Christian missionaries from England were trying to come and convert them to uh, Church of England, believe it or not, in the 19th century. I'm interested tonight, rather, 
in the issue of the Zionist movement in the state of Israel, and how these related to the Ethiopian Jews, and that's a 20th century story. I would throw in one important fact. Alone among African countries, let's go to the next slide, Ethiopia was not colonized, colonialized. If you look at Africa in 1914, over there, 100 years ago, you see there's only one place really that's white, meaning that it doesn't have color on the map. All those countries that have colors were taken over and annexed by European states. It's the uh, um, height of the European colonialism. So the blue stuff is, is the French, right? The purple in the middle is there should be Belgium. Stupid little Belgium owned the Congo, which is 100 times bigger than Belgium. Uh, the British, okay, or they had other color all over the place. You got your Portuguese, the Spanish. Every country, or many countries in Europe, own pieces of Karka in Africa. The only, meaning they conquered them, they took them over because they were natives and the Europeans had uh, modern weapons and they weren't able to fight back. Uh, the only exception is Ethiopia. Now you could argue with me and somebody's going, I know there's a math and science person who said, Rabbi Kenneth, what about all the way on the left-hand side in what we call uh, West Africa, you see uh, Liberia. On the, but that's not really true. Liberia was actually a colony of the United States disguised as an independent state. The only country that was genuinely independent was Ethiopia. Uh, and that's because, um, let's put it this way, uh, the Ethiopians defeated the attempts of the Europeans uh, to conquer them and colonize them. Let's go to the next one. As a matter of fact, the Ethiopian king defeated the Europeans and he himself went on to brutally conquer a whole lot of territory in Africa and create the modern state of Ethiopia. Now, it's true that they're facing the Italian army. I can't deny that. But the fact is, the Ethiopian, relatively primitive, defeated the Italian army in the Battle of Ottawa. So that's the only time a native army beat a modern European army. I say it's against the Italians. So whatever. Uh, Italians are better at the pizza than at the colonization. But nevertheless, uh, as a result of this, Ethiopia was never taken over by any other country. And as I just said before, let's go to the next one. If you look at these two uh, maps here, you see that you see, you see the arrows, the old state of Ethiopia under Menelik. He was the guy who defeated the Italians, Menelik II. He uh, doubled the size of the country, didn't he? Look how they, and when they t took over in this area, you know, to the south, and um, the south in general, southwest, southeast, and so forth. I mean, they conquered all kind of other African groups and killed them and subjected them. So basically, the Ethiopians did to other black African tribes and groups what the Europeans were doing elsewhere. So the Ethiopians are not colonized, they are colonizers. The Ethiopians are not victims of imperialism, they are imperialists. So I'm just trying to tell you, talking about the Jews in Ethiopia, it's not Stam a regular African country, it's a very unique African country, okay? Now, we're not talking about a Tarzan movie over here, we're talking about a country with an army and all the rest of it. It's a complex, impressive, violent state mm -hmm. with a long history of Christian persecution of the Jews. Because Ethiopia is one of the first countries in the world to adopt Christianity, their own particular type of Christianity, Coptic. Uh, some of us will be aware of the fact they're right in the middle of Gaul, I guess. You have that big area that you just walk around, you don't even know it's there. That's a big Ethiopian church compound, and sometimes you see the Ethiopian priests with their whole getup. They've been there for centuries. Uh, the Ethiopian Christian church has been there for a long time, and they fought big wars in their history. I'm not going to give you the details tonight against Jews. And uh, by the time you get to the 19th century, 20th century, the Jews are a defeated and persecuted minority under the Christians. It's not Hitler, but it's like the Jews in Spain or something like that. No, they were subject to constant religious persecution, uh, constant attempts to uh, k kidnap and uh, forcibly convert Jews. They had a hard time, the Jews, the Ethiopian Jews, had a hard time living in Ethiopia. Um, they always lived on the edge as was the case in the old days in Europe when times were bad, when sufferance and of service to the rulers, uh, this guy Menelik, you know, they, they made all of his uh, jewelry or something like that, and even then, Kula Haibulai, even when times are said to be good, if they misstepped or did anything wrong, the ruler or the nobles or the government officials would come down upon them and they'd be persecuted, synagogues would be destroyed and people would get killed and women would get raped. It was a bummer being a Jew living in Ethiopia. Echoes to the heart of my story tonight. Now, um, you have an anti-Semitic problem here, lasting throughout the 20th century, I repeat. 
an anti-Semitic problem of a nice-sized Jewish population lasting throughout the 20th century, but it was not brought to the attention of the world by the Anti-Defamation League, the World Jewish Congress, or any other Jewish organizations. Which talk interesting. Right? Wherever there was persecuted Jews elsewhere, the Jews raise hell, as they should. So how come nobody ever thinks about the continuing, long-standing persecution of the Jews by Christians, all of whom are black, in Ethiopia? Isn't it funny that nobody ever said anything about this? During the 50 years of Zionism, Zionism started in 1897, with Theodor Herzl's first Basel Congress, and of course came to its culmination in 1947, when the United Nations proclaimed the partition plan and set up the State of Israel. So during the 50 years of Zionism, the main efforts, as I think you know if you've ever followed any of my talks, of the Zionist organization was to bring in a Gucci Aliyah, they always call it. They wanted Ashkenazi Jews to come in and be the uh, Olim. They didn't even want Sephardim. <laughs> okay? That's already uh, too low for them. Now, the reason is that the Zionists wanted modern European Jews who were Western educated, or at least open to Western education and culture, and they desperately, the Zionist movement always said, we want a Western and not a Levantine state. We don't want a state which is Mediterranean and uh, La Dolce Vita and so forth. And, you know, we want a, a country to be like England, France, Germany, Holland, you know, something like that. Okay? And uh, therefore, if you go to the next slide, they didn't want, the Zionist movement wasn't interested in importing these kind of Jews to Israel, and they did not do so. What you see on the right, for example, is a couple. The girl looks like she's uh, off to some Halloween party. No, that's how the well-dressed, middle-class, Jew or Arab dresses in Tunisia around 1900. That's all. It's a different culture. The Zionists would be horrified. It's, it's, it's primitive. You understand? We, we, we don't want guys like on the left-hand side. We were dressed, once again, in totally normal Middle, middle Eastern, middle-class uh, uh, clothes for people of that class in, um, in Algeria. They don't want that. Now, uh, this is racism. It is what it is. As you and I know, the 1940s modified all that, didn't it? You had the Holocaust, which wiped out the European Jews. And then you have, in 1948, the establishment of the radically underpopulated state of Israel. The number one problem Ben-Gurion faced once the state of Israel came into being and they defeated the Arabs was, we have too few people, 650,000 Jews. He had speech after speech and we said, we have old territories of Israel, no Jews are living there. How can we intend to hold it on and keep the Arabs from moving back? We're radically underpopulated. And so, they adopted a policy of mass aliyah of even the Sephardim, held their nose, and brought in the Sephardim. Even then, if you know your Israeli history, there were many um, important Israeli officials and leaders who deprecated a non guchi aliyah. Okay? They said, we want to bring in the right type, and we don't want to bring the Jews from Morocco and Iran and all that. But these guys were suppressed by Ben-Gurion. That's who Ben-Gurion was. And in the early years of the State of Israel, he said, as you see over here, we need a mass aliyah, to fill up the country and we'll take whatever we can get. We'll bring the Jews from Yemen, we'll bring the Jews from Iraq, we'll bring the Jews from uh, Morocco, as they say, and wherever. You know, and even though I'm a hold my nose, and they used to call him uh, Homer and the Shiloh Tov, not good human material, the rest of it, but we need Jews. We'll take what we can get. Okay? And indeed, I think we all know, the Aliyah in the early years of Israel doubled the Jewish population. But of course, as we know, it was accompanied by a lot of racism and resentment. I'll just say Shal Shabbat, you know, you understand what I mean. I've mentioned many times. And, and just was speaking about this for the elections in Israel the other day, about the, you know, uh, 1984 elections and Menachem Begin and so forth. Uh, there was a dialogue of the death during the years of the Mapai. The Sephardim, the Yemenites all say, you treat us like savages. And you had, what kind of response from Golda Meir and the others? Uh, are you kidding? Let's go to the next one. Uh... When you came to Israel, you didn't know how to use a fork. You didn't know what a toilet was. So we taught you. So look at that. That's a dialogue of the deaf. This one say you disrespect me. The other one said, well, you deserve no respect. You should be glad that we introduced you to the ABCs of being a civilized human being. Great idea for a dialogue, guys. Now, to the Ashkenazi Israelis, the Sephardim were black. Okay? The Ashkenazi were white. Take a look at this clip one second before you show it from Sal Shabbati and listen to, you can read the, the, the what do you call it, the subtitles. And it's, a, it's a comedy, but it's a social criticism comedy. And it's supposed to be from the 50s. 
And what do you see? Saul so Zabati in, in one of his daily zany uh, things needs money and uh, kidnaps a dog. I mean, he gets a dog. And, you know, the, uh, there was an Ashkenazi German couple who said they lost their pooch, you know, some kind of white uh, little poodle or something like that. And he brings some regular dog. And you'll see the lady said like this, but this dog is black. We wanted them white. And Saul will say, that's always the problem with this country. If it's white, it's good. If it's black, it's bad. See, he's comment. It was a, it's a play written by uh, Fran Kisha. He's commenting already on the fact that the country is divided between white and black, and I'm not referring to Negroid, but the Sephardim who look back. This is racism, okay? It's terrible. It's what happened. And you know everything in society is organized around the perceived skin color or something along these lines. So take a look. It's funny, but it's tragic at the same time. So that's the humorous uh, twist on it. But in, in this humorous way, what's he talking about? He's talking about a color bar. It's the white and the black. And we're not talking about people from Africa, right? Maybe North Africa, not from Africa, Africa. And so what I'm trying to say is like this. That's what, this, what, what the system could bear in the early years of Israel, unfortunately. No one at that time in Israel gave consideration to bringing the Ethiopian Jews who were really black. Except some Israeli and Sochnut uh, bureaucrats who started in those years to survey Jewish communities around the world once Israel passed the law of return. Because they said, what did we let ourselves in for? Who, exa who exactly was a Jew? Israel, in 1951, passed the Chok Ashlut, which basically said, if you're Jewish, you can come right away and you're a citizen of Israel. No waiting process. If you want to, wherever you are, you come now, you land in Israel, you say, I want to be a citizen, you're in. Okay? Many countries have this, by the way, but Israel's one of them. The question, of course, goes <coughs> as follows. Who's a Jew? So somebody could get up the plane and say like this. Uh, I uh, declared myself Jewish in Canada. They want to be in Israel. Is that right? Uh, let me put it this way. Uh, suppose you have today, as you do, a reform rabbi who says, I want to solve the Arab-Israeli problem, and I'm anti-Zionist, so I'm going to send out a online form which will automatically declare anyone who, who press a button that they're Jewish. And I'm, a call, I'm just making some. And I'm a qualified reform rabbi. He's ordained, but he happens to have radical opinions in the Arab-Israeli uh, conflict issue. And he's going to declare all the Palestinians to be Jews. And then they're going to be automatic citizens of Israel. And then once they're citizens of Israel, they can all vote. And then they can vote the Jews out. How do you stop that from a legal point of view? What's the definition of Jewish? So, because of that, already in the beginning, Ben-Gurion was okay with a halachic definition. it has got to be a Jewish mother, right? With a certain amount of flexibility. Let's go to the next one. There's Ben-Gurion, the arch-secularist on the left-hand side, butting up with his friend Rabbi Gorin, right? And there's Gorin on the right-hand side dancing on Simcha Star with Gitzhak Rabin when he was a general in the army. And Ben-Gurion said many times, he says, I'm in favor of the halachic system, I need flexibility. See Ben-Gurion's daughter-in-law with not Jewish, for example. Things like that. So here or there, I need to, to bend the rules. But overall, I agree that should be a halachic definition because that way prevents what I just described. The, the problem goes as follows. Giyur kalacha. If you have people who say you're defining Jewish as somebody whose mother is Jewish, okay, I get that. So then you sort of protect yourself against somebody, as I say, overnight declaring all the Arabs or whatever, Africans, you know, Sudanese as, as Jews, you know, and gaming the system that way. So you have to have a Jewish mother. But it's also true that the law said anyone who was converted to Judaism defined that. Now, de facto, and this has always been a hot-button issue until today, it's got to be gir kalacha, more or less. Right? Meaning what they're basically saying is it has to be orthodox conversion uh, approved by the chief rabbi of Israel. And that's what it's been since 1948. And even though you find a lot of controversy in the internet back and forth, and I get it, and I understand that people are uncomfortable with it. But this has always been like a safety net for Israel against what I just described as somebody who could simply flood the country with instant converts. And nowadays, you have every type of Tom, Dick, and Harry rabbi out there. And so a person can say like this, I'm a secular humanist rabbi, I believe in the, in the bunny rabbit, and I declare 
all Chinese to be Jewish. Boom. And 90% of them are going to come to the country and they can take it over. And from the legal perspective, what, what do you say against that? Because it says anybody who's Jewish can come to Israel. I'm trying to show you the uh, consequences, seen and unforeseen, when Israel declared this, what they thought was a wonderful idea, and anybody Jewish can come to Israel and be automatically a citizen. Okay? Now, in this context, you've had, not like I just described some phony baloney situation, but you had, already in the 1950s, um, Israeli and Jewish agency representatives saying, what about these Jews from India? What about these Jews from here? What about these Jews from there? What is exactly their status? And they were looking at Jewish communities in all kinds of exotic and outlier places of the world, including the Jews of Ethiopia. That's one group, not the only group. As part of the bureaucratic process, back in the 50s, they consulted the chief rabbi of Israel. Let's go to the next one. Ralph Herzog, who's Ashkenazi, was a tremendous goan. And he had a funny attitude. On the one hand, he said that we should bring the Ethiopian Jews to Israel now under the Chok HaShavut. On the other hand, I'm not 100% sure he said if they're really Jewish. Because even though the Radbaz said so in the Shalos and Shuvahs, Baruch Herzog had two PhDs, not one. He was highly educated in uh, secular uh, uh, culture. And he knew that from a historic and ethnographic up, up point of view, the question of whether the Jews are really Jewish in Ethiopia is highly debatable. Viewing the matter through purely halachic lenses, because that's what he says, the chief rabbi, he says, so what do we do? I think they should be brought to Israel, because they're suffering in, in Ethiopia. As far as the question of whether they're really Jewish or not, and uh, you have Mamzerus issues and things of this nature, the best approach would be to make everybody be Megayar Lechumra. Bring the Ethiopian Jews to Israel, and have everybody undergo a Gayrus process. And, uh, you know, and the idea is like it's no hard feelings. I myself in the rabbi business, sometimes you find a situation for Shaduchim, it could happen, that someone is from now, but maybe the mother, the grandmother thinks, you know, the garrison is questionable, and sometimes the rabbi say like this, you know, just to make life easier and get all things out of it, let's just do another garrison now. Uh, not that there's any uh, aspersions cast on the previous one, and that way when you start going out or something like that, there'd be no question whatsoever you're, you're Jewish. If they call it Gerus Lachoma. You see? Uh, if it's taken in the right spirit, and it usually is in my experience, the person not offended, they say, I just want to do whatever it do so I can go and get married and build a regular life and so on and so forth. I get that. That's doing things through a very narrow legalistic um, perspective. I'm part of that world. That's, it's called the rabbis. They look at things from a very narrow, halakhic, and legalistic uh, perspective. Okay? And uh, it wasn't exactly a Geras Lechumra, but it kind of, meaning, it's not the way it usually is, it's just as a community, we're not 100% sure that you're Jewish. And this way, there be no question that you're Jewish. And I know you consider yourself Jewish, and you have suffered from being Jewish for many centuries. And so this way it'll, uh, you know, dot the I's and cross the T's as it is. That's why I said there, he had an ambivalent and legalistic uh, sense, stance. Now, I'm sure Rav Herzig meant well, and he did. He was a good person. He himself, he said, if I had the strength, I would go visit the Jews in Ethiopia and find out what's going on. But you can understand from the point of view of the Ethiopian Jews, it's very insulting. <laughs> now, it's a question, after all, he said, my father got killed for being Jewish, my grandfather got killed, now you tell me, I'm not sure, I've got to be a bit Megayer. And it was emotionally painful, and it has remained culturally insulting and emotionally painful down to the present day among this population. So, uh, are you telling me that the state of Israel brought in Jews from all over the world and brought in no Jews from Ethiopia? I am telling you that. Well, a few. Uh, but just to teach them Hebrew and send them back. It was a, it was a uh, Jewish Jim Crow. It's a sad fact. It's a sad fact. Here's my point. By the mid-1950s, the great tidal wave of Aliyah was over. When Israel became a state in '48. I think you noticed this whole Salah Shabbat thing, as I always call it, was from uh, when they took in hundreds of thousands and overwhelmed the country, and the Mabara, and the country was just, could not really handle it properly. That's the years 48 to 52, let's say. Okay? That's when they brought in hundreds of thousands from all over the place, and uh, it was just terrible. Okay? But Ben Gurion said we need it now, and that's why they did it. But uh, after 1952, 53, so that was over. 
And uh, from then on, rest of the 50s and 60s, Israel said, we're going to have Aliyah, but in smaller numbers. I'm going to take in a quarter of a million at a time. Smaller numbers. The Israeli government and the Sakhnur were aware of the screw-ups that they had inflicted on the Olim during the tidal wave, the intense human suffering, and the interminable Ma'abarot. We've discussed this in the past. So by 1954-55, they were going to do smaller groups, still in tens of thousands, in more digestible ways, they hoped. So if you take a look at the next slide, if you look at the figures, how many people did they take in in these countries? Well, it's 18,000 in 1954, 37,000 in 55. It jumps up to 50, 60, even 70,000 in 57. That's a lot. But then it drops to the 20s, you know, 62 or 60. You see what I'm saying? No, it's nowhere near 100, 200, 300,000 people at a time. And they got rid of the Malbarad. They had a system where they drive you from the airport or the, or the Haifa to the house where you're going to live in. Now they still screwed him over. They dumped him in places like in the Negev and, you know, uh, what do you call it, the Yerucham and uh, in the Tivot and all this kind of stuff. Still a lot of mistakes and painful things were inflicted upon the population, but it wasn't as bad as round one. Okay? Now, um, the population that you see in these figures over here were mainly from North Africa, you know, Morocco, and, and, uh, Algeria, and Tun Tunisia, and from Romania, and from Poland. Okay? What about Ethiopia? They're not in there. Okay. Israel clearly made a decision not to bring in the Jews from Ethiopia. Uh, let's go to the next one. And they said so. Here's a statement from a high official in the Sakhnut. In 1956, there is much spade work to be done in training the philosophers in Ethiopia before a thought could be given to bring them to Israel. The reasons are single and weighty. On the one hand, they are well off where they are. Not true. While their development and mental outlook is that of children, there's your racism, they could fall an easy prey of exploitation and brought here without any preparation. <laughs> We're afraid, I'm going to leave you in Gola because you come to Israel be taken advantage of, really? On the other hand, being a backward element, they would be unproductive and would take years before they could be educated towards a minimum of progressive thinking. And as experience has shown time and time again, the fully grown up and elderly people would never change at all. So basically, this is such a bureaucratic Israeli Zionist thing, and it's disgusting. So let, let them stay back in Ethiopia. If they bring them here, it'll be too hard of a process for us to, uh, to process them. That is the basis upon which you make Chok HaShavut. What's the real reason? Is the reason because they're black. Uh, you know, that, 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 that's what that's all about. Okay? <coughs> this is plain racism. Now, and this was the years of Ben-Gurion and Golda and all the rest of it. On the other hand, together with feelings of racism, there also existed a remote sense of kinship. The Jews felt that these were kind of Jews. So you have an existential tension, as they always call it, between we don't want these guys here in Israel, on the other hand, we, but, but they're Jewish. We have responsibility towards them. The resolution of this tension was in a program to bring a tiny number of kids, teach them Ivrit and regular Judaism, non-Ethiopian Judaism, and then send them back to de-Ethiopianize their fellow Jews back home. So in other words, cultural imperialism. We want the Jews in Ethiopia to be like the Jews in Israel. Based on the th Shita, your Judaism is wrong, our Judaism is right, convert to our type of Judaism. And that's why you see in the next picture, in 56, they brought 12 kids to Karbatia. Karbatia is a Mizrahi, meaning a religious Zionist um, children's um, settlement, in which they're supposed to have, you know, it's but it's supposed to be very progressive in the education type. And you bring these 12 Ethiopian kids, but they had to swear when they get there on a Tanakh that they wouldn't stay in Israel, they'd go back to Ethiopia. Imagine that. Okay? Imagine that. What other group of Jews around the world had to undergo something like that. Now, at this time, back in Ethiopia, the Jews are suffering discrimination and persecution, bad but not severe. Bad but not severe, under the Emperor Haile Selassie, uh, who was afraid that if he's too cruel to the Jews, he'll lose American support, and he needed that to stay in power. Under normal circumstances, if the State of Israel found that there was a large group of Jews anywhere, and they were subject to persecution, and it's possible to get them out, they would do so. Right? Here, let's go to the next one. 
This is the Ethiopian emperor who was there from the 20s to the 70s, a long time, Haile Selassie, and uh, he's a Christian, and uh, he's not friendly to the Jews, the opposite. And he doesn't want him to leave the country, like Stalin didn't want the Jews to leave the country. But Israel played along with him, you see? Now, Ben-Gurion, at that time, for strategic purposes, wanted to establish what I call Mossad relations with Ethiopia. Let's go to the next one. Here you see Israel. If you look down where Ethiopia is, you see geographically where it's located, down, the de down by the Dead Sea, to the end, and through the Bab al and then to the, what is it called, the Arabian Sea. And um, Ben-Gurion was facing the Arab uh, enmity, and one of the things he did in the late 50s with the Mossad was to hook up, establish uh, secret and intimate relations with countries beyond, behind the Arabs. So basically Turkey, Iran, and Ethiopia. Okay? Turkey at that time wasn't a Turkey of today, so it was anti-Arab, so Ben-Gurion had secret uh, uh, deals with Turkey, secret deal with the Shah of Iran, and secret deals with the Emperor of Ethiopia uh, will help you against the Arabs and you help Israel in some kind of way or other. And so the main uh, presence in that country was not the embassy, but the Mossad center. Okay? Now, what I'm trying to say is, so Ben-Gurion said, we don't want to take off the Emperor of Ethiopia, so we're in bed with him for political purposes. Golda Meir, this is when she was the foreign minister, as we see in the next slide. And she said she's an idealist, as if she used to go to Africa, and we're spreading, uh, you know, uh, medical knowledge and modern technology, and Israel's not an imperialistic country, it's the opposite, and uh, we want to help the Africans, all part of a plan that these people would vote for Israel in the UN, which did not happen. Now, what I'm trying to say is Israel had a big presence, big presence in the late 50s and early 60s, in Africa, black Africa. Uh, all over the place. They had these um, technical missions, medical missions, uh, agricultural missions, and all kinds of things like that in every, just about every black country in Africa. Uh, they never brought up the Ethiopian Jews when they talked to the Ethiopians, even though they had leverage. I'm telling you, if Israel would have said at that time, let us take out 20,000 Ethiopian Jews or 10,000 a year, still a hate, uh, because after all, Israel's helping Ethiopia. They set up a university for them, they set up a hospital for them, they, they trained the uh, bodyguards of the emperor, they uh, had Mossad guys being extra guards for the emperor. Uh, Israel did, did plenty for Ethiopia in those years. There wasn't even a hint, maybe let some Jews come out and emigrate to Israel. So it's pretty disgusting. Because right? basically what they're saying is like this, I know you're getting screwed over in Ethiopia, but uh, we don't want these people in Israel. Okay. Meanwhile, the Sakhnut, had started a school or two or three in Ethiopia to teach them Ivrit, and then they pulled the plug. They said there's no money for it. And so, quite a few African students in those years uh, studied in Israel as a result of the Golden Meir policies. Understand what I mean? What Israel did as part of their African policy during those years was to present themselves as the best friend of black Africa. I'm serious. And one of the things they did was they invited a ton of students from various African countries, the Kenya, the Congo, I don't know, the Tanzania, uh, Ghana, you name it, to come, uh, Ethiopia, to come and study in Hebrew University, in the Technion, in the medical schools, and that kind of stuff. If you came to Israel in those years, you would see a whole bunch of African students who were going free to Israel. The idea of what Israel hoped was, this person would come a doctor, come back, they speak Hebrew, they'll be friendly to Israel, they'll be a good hashba. It's not a bad policy. Some of these Ethiopian students that went to study in Israel, Jewish. Ethiopian Jewish, okay? Now, um, they are subject to the rules of all the African students, which is you can study in Israel, but then you have to go home and can't settle here. Now, there are others that are not Jewish. These guys are Jewish. And so, the 50s and early 60s go by with no change. Now, there had been, among some Zionists, veteran ones, Idealist, a desire to do something. If you go to the next one, there was a guy, Arya Tarkakover, who was a big Zionist uh, macher, and Norman Bentwich and others. They actually formed a um, committee called the Committee to Help the, uh, the Ethiopian Jews around 1960 or so, because it was bothering, like, nothing's happening over here. But what happened? They were shut down by the Israeli government who told them secretly, shut up and, 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 and don't go this way, because we don't want to bring them in. Let's go to the next one the Minister of the Interior, who is a religious Zionist. 
he was a real villain in this piece. Dr. Berg, who was, you know, every government, he was the Minister of the Interior, over and over again. If you remember those years. Under Ben-Gurion, and under Eshkel, and under Golda Meir, and under Menachem Begin. Mitzvah Rabin, you know, that's a, was a, that kind of politician. And uh, he's a from guy, a Shema Shabbos, and done like the Africans. And so we don't want him here. It'd be, bring a mess. Okay? So, this situation went on. What I'm trying to get at you again and again is, here Israel was in existence for a long time. You could have ended the anti-Semitism that these people were living in under difficult conditions in Ethiopia all during these years, and Israel never, Israel never made a move to do so. And then finally something starts to happen, starts to happen, and from an unexpected quarter. Uh, this is really the beginning of our story tonight, which is why I have to break it up into two parts. And it starts with a real character, a soldier in the IDF, who created the office of drill sergeant, sergeant major. Uh, okay, and let's go to the next one. Uh, looks like a cartoon, but it's really got... There was a guy named Avad uh, and among other things, he, when, it, when the Sahal started in 48, 49, he was the one in the main camp who created the system of how you drill, how you train, uh, uh, you know, routines, rookie soldiers, uh, what exactly is the, uh, the, you know, the, the march, and all the things that, that go with the drill sergeant, Rob Sarin, he's a sergeant major. Now, how did he know? This is a story that deserves a movie, in my opinion. This guy was actually a Yemenite Jew, or Aden Jew. I told you, Aden was a small piece of Yemen that was ruled by the British. But they're that type of Jew, Yemenite Jew. His father was a Rav, Taimani rabbi. And his father, he's born in 1922, his father was serving for 10 years or something as the Rav of the Taimani community in Eritrea and Asmara, meaning the Ethiopian territory. Now at that time, Eritrea, which you saw before as the province opposite Yemen, was an Italian colony. The Italians were not able to conquer Ethiopia, but the Italians had a small strip called Eritrea. And one of the cities there is Asmara. I know these names don't mean anything to you. And all I can say is, in Ethiopia, or right adjacent to Ethiopia, was a whole, not a Sephardi, but a Tamani community. And this guy is born there. Uh, his father's the Rav. Uh, he goes to Italian school. But he also is living among all these Ethiopian-type people, and therefore, as a kid, he learns Amharic. He, he, he speaks perfect Ethiopian, because that was his experience growing up. This is unique. And then, when he's uh, 13 years old, the family makes Aliyah. This is in the 1930s. And uh, he joined eventually the Haganah, and he fought in the Jewish Brigade in World War II, which means that he was in the British Army, a Jewish unit of the British Army, in which he was exposed to the British tradition of the Sergeant Major, who, you know, runs all the, uh, this is called non-commissioned officers. An army depends on non-commissioned officers. I don't want to go to a whole routine over there because it'll take too long. But without your sergeants and your corporals, nothing runs. Okay? The commissioned officers is from lieutenant up. But non-commissioned officers are your sergeants and your corporals of various grades. Master sergeant, this sergeant, that sergeant. The top of the thing was the uh, sergeant major, which I think in America is a, is, is a master sergeant. My father-in-law was a master sergeant, for example, in World War II. Uh, and uh, I'll tell you again, if you really know your military stuff, armies that rise and fall depending on how good their non-coms are. Now, um, it's a whole subject, it's a very interesting subject. And so he learned Hilcha's sergeant major from being in the British Army, the Jewish Brigade, and consequently when the war was over, he joined the IDF back in 1948, and he already, you see that handlebar muscle, that's very typical of the British sergeant majors, and he became an iconic figure because he was the guy that the recruits meet at the uh, central um, training base for decades, okay? And he said, you know, stand up, uh, I teach you how to do a tan shunt, present arms, right face, left face, all that junk, okay? So he was a well-known figure in Israel, and uh, that's what he did for life. In 1966, when he was in his 40s, he had a vacation. He said, I'm going to go back to where I was born, Asmar in, in, in Eritrea, which by now was annexed to Ethiopia after World War II, okay? And uh, now he meets Ethiopian Jews with whom he can communicate because he speaks Amhari, he speaks Ethiopian. So he's kind of, you know, from his youth. And this guy, Ovad Yechezi, immediately sizes up the situation. There's a large Jewish population over there that's getting screwed by the Zionist system. And he's, he's a, a, a big cog in the Israeli army, he knows the system very well. And he found a cause to which he dedicated the rest of his life. He returns to Israel, 
And by the way, he fought in the, in the uh, Six Day War and he got a medal and all that. He meets with the few Ethiopian students who are there at Kfarbatia and a couple other places. And he finds that they are in terror and anguish. It's 1966. They're in anguish because they're not allowed to settle in Israel. <coughs> they're Jewish, they want to make Aliyah. <coughs> ne forget Nefesh Nefesh. He's a Jewish guy. Okay, he's black. So what? He's a Jewish guy or girl. And they've been in Kfarbatia. They said, this is where I want to live. They can't do it. And they're in terror because they've all received Tzav Gerush. Uh, official notices to leave the country immediately or face arrest and deportation. So they're doing this to Jews in a Jewish state. Avad Yechezi does two things. Number one, he hides them in private houses. And so here we have an underground railroad in the state of Israel in the 1960s. Protecting <laughs> black Jews from white Jews. This is terrible. Okay? He hides them in others and houses that... So he's using his experience when he was the Haganah and all that to hide from the British. Now he's doing against the Israelis. So just... I don't, you want to see what I'm saying? You have a kid who spent a couple years in Kfarbat and now speaks of Brit, is a from Jew or whatever. Boy, girl. They don't want to leave the country. The police are looking for them. And so I have to put you somewhere and nobody should tell you. And number two, he begins a campaign to change things. In other words, Israel is a democracy. It can happen. It's never easy, but it can happen. The thing of a democracy is, if you organize yourself, you get enough people and this and that and the other, usually takes a long time, but anything can happen. Anything can happen. Now, he gets, for example, uh, he recruits pro bono lawyers to uh, get other illegal Ethiopian Jews out of jail, the ones who weren't smart enough to get in the underground system. Uh, because, you know, lawyers can use all kind of uh, legal tactics to do that. He forms committees and puts VIPs on them. He does PR. He does media. It's an uphill battle. In the late 60s, Israel has other things on its mind. This is, as we see in the next one, right after the 60s, where, when Israel conquered his whole empire. Remember that? In the old days, from the Suez Canal to the Golan Heights, Israel was drunk with victory. The last thing they're thinking about is, what do you do about the Ethiopian Jews? It was also, my friends, the last years before the storm erupts in Ethiopia as we shall see next time. They could have gotten all the Jews out before all the trouble hit the fan. This is a great tragedy, in my opinion. Okay? Uh, because starting in 1974, Ethiopia became a hell. And you could have easily gotten them out in the years before that. Anyway, this era of 1967 to 73, between the Six Day War and the Yom Kippur War, by the time of these types of people and groups forming in Israel, you know, the Committee for Ethiopian Jews, the Committee for Ethiopian Jewish Students, that's not the other. But the problem was in coordinating an action plan with the Jews in Ethiopia who were politically primitive, politically innocent, unaware of how to do PR and media, and trusting, these Jews were trusting, that the State of Israel will soon do the right thing by them, even though 20 years have passed and it wasn't even true. The State of Israel, that era, which was led by Golda Meir, Moshe Dayan, and Dr. Berg of the Mizrahi movement, a State of Israel where the religious authorities, the Rabbanim, and the Frum world, were people into whose parochial consciousness the reality of these black Jews in far-off Africa did not really penetrate. No one said, let's get them out of here before trouble begins. Instead, it's an unspoken racism. Israel is enough trouble. We don't need a Negro problem like they have in America. I'm sure that's what they thought. By the Frum, you could always say, well, you know, B'nai Brock, who knows if they're halakhically Jewish. From the halakhic point of view, it's a can of worms. A difficult sugya in terms of their identity, conversion, and who knows what else. Let's kick this can down the road as long as we can. The problem, of course, is you're dealing with human beings. Right? You're dealing with human beings here. Human beings who felt passionately Jewish and who continued to suffer anti-Semitism and even random violence, kidnappings, and forced conversions, even as the state of Israel was nearby and in existence for 25 years. We complain today, as we see in the next slide, the American Jews were silent during World War II. Isn't that right? There's that new book out from Professor Mead about Stephen Wise. And Stephen Wise is simply the iconic face of the whole American Jewish community, with exceptions. For the overwhelming majority of the official American community, what we today call the uh, Federations, the Associates, and the others, they shut off during World War II, right? We know this, this uh, problem. So, terrible things were happening in Europe. And in America, they didn't do anything about it. As a matter of fact, if they did anything about it, it was, as we see in the next one, to try to shut down the Jews who protested. Remember the Bergson Committee? And they put ads in, in the uh, 
New York Times and all the papers across America, especially the Hearst papers, because Hearst believed in their cause and gave them free ads. And four million Jews are waiting for death. Oh, hang and burn, but quiet, Jews. Don't be bothersome. Save your breath. The world is busy with other news. This is what they published the paper. Well, this was to catch the attention of the non-Jews in America. What was the reaction of the Federation, the Associated? Who gave you the right to put in ads uh, without asking us? In other words, they came down on the people, the whistleblowers, instead of coming down on the real problem, which was their own apathy and their indifference to the uh, death of uh, six million Jews at that time. So the silence, that's what you had, mutatis mutandis, it's not a holocaust, but nevertheless you had a Jewish community in pain, and nobody did a doggone thing about it. The silence of the authorities in Israel, the silence of the American Jewish establishment, an establishment that was so vocal and active in the, str the struggle for civil rights for blacks in America in the 1960s, but was silent regarding the plight of blacks who were Jewish in Africa. It's an interesting story that, in my opinion, has not yet been analyzed by the historians. Okay? Uh, it will one day. It's a, it's a certain hypocrisy. They used to carry on Martin Luther King and all the rest of it. That's fine. What about the other Jews who are suffering in Africa? Well, that's different. They're being persecuted by other blacks. What's that matter? What's that matter? Okay? Uh, take a look at the next one. We all talked today about how Abraham Joshua Heschel, oh, he was so vocal, he was the best friend of Martin Luther King, he marched in the marches. So why didn't Abraham Joshua Heschel say anything about the persecution being suffered by the black Jews in Ethiopia? In other words, what I'm saying is like this. Why is it a terrible crime if a white man shoots a black guy, but it's not a crime if a black man shoots a black guy? What's that? Okay? This is the wall of apathy, red tape, racism, and inertia that Avadi Hezi and the other do-gooders ran into time and time again as they sought to change the public consciousness in Israel and bring the Ethiopian Jews into Israel and deal with whatever problems of absorption and aliyah within the safety of the Jewish state. Get these guys the heck out of Ethiopia, bring them to Israel. At least in, Ethiopia, at least in Israel, they will not be persecuted for being Jewish. Right? At least in one of the anti-Semitism. And whatever issues we have, we'll, work, we'll deal with it. You understand? We'll do our best. With hindsight, it's remarkable. But at that time, there was no hindsight. Ovadia Yechezi and his company were feeling their way through the bureaucratic maze. Once Ovadia Yechezi realized this, it took him a couple years. He went to a formal rabbinic authority, one of the leading rabbis in Israel, one of the leading rabbis in the Rabbanut HaRashit. Somebody was the chief rabbi of Tel Aviv, and he thought that from him, He'll get a definitive answer, and it'll matter to the other Rabbonim, because he's a big Talmud Chacham, and I'm referring to Vadi Yosef, in his early years, when he was the chief rabbi of Tel Aviv, and was about to become the chief rabbi of Israel. Uh, his career was about to take off. If I said Avadi Yosef to you in 1970, most of you would not have any idea what I'm talking about. If I said Avadi Yosef to you today, everybody knows what I'm talking about. So this guy got to him in the early years, when he already published many for him. Now, Ovadi Chesi's father was a Yemenite Rav. You understand? An Aden Rav. So his automatic Kesha was Avad Yosef. He said, I know who you are. Your father's Rabbi so and so and such and such. And Avad Yechezi says to Avad Yosef, Can you give me a clear psak, a clear ruling, one way or the other? Right? Because the Israelis and the Sachnut, very piously and hypocritically, are saying, Well, I don't know if they're Jewish, that's why we're not going to make any efforts to do it. Can you get some clear cut over here, as we say in the Yeshiva world? After all, you're Avad Yosef. You're obviously a big deal. And as I say, this is just before Avad Yosef became the chief rabbi of Israel, the Rishon Lezion. So he's really going to be within the Israeli political and legal context, the supreme rabbinical authority in terms of issuing rulings uh, that are nugia to a Jewish identity for them. And we have this very interesting story of Avadia meeting Avadia. Avadia Chazi, Avadia Yosef. Now, Israel, this can happen. <laughs> In Israel, this can happen. And Avadia Yosef said, I guess, Bring me these Ethiopian guys from the Underground Railroad. I want to talk to them to do my own research. Which is, by the way, is the right way to go about it. Would you agree? You're asking me to go up soccer over here? I want to see who we're talking about. Let me talk to these guys. Avadia Chesi brings them from the Underground Railroad. Neither Avadia, this is 1972, 73, neither of these two realizes that in Ethiopia, a political volcano is about to erupt which will change everything. But I think I've spoken a lot. It's too late already. And uh, you'll already be by midnight on Saturday night. So I'll carry this over into next time. So I wish you a good night and a good vach.